All right, uh, before we get started today, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first announcement is that uh, the last homework is due today. So make sure you turn that in. Uh, second announcement is that uh, there will be lecture Thursday, but there will be no office hours. Uh, the EECS retreat, department retreat, is Thursday and Friday, and it's off-site. So I'll come in and give the lecture, and then I have to leave. So we will not have office hours on Thursday, but we will have lecture on Thursday. Uh, the next announcement is that next Tuesday, which is our last lecture, uh, will be no lecture. Uh, I had actually arranged for someone to, to give a lecture, but uh, that didn't work out, so there will be no lecture next week. Uh, what I thought we could use that time for is actually the, um, the room is available, and I'm out of town. That's why there's no lecture. Um, but you guys are welcome to come here and talk about the project, you know, if you want to compare notes to other teams and discuss where they're at and things like that. And if you want to make some last minute changes, it's a good opportunity. Okay. Uh, let's also talk a little bit about the project. I want to get some more people in because this concerns the whole class. So ha has anyone here met the specs for the project? Okay, nobody. Yeah. I think I think I have, but the power is ridiculous. Okay, what what kind of power are we talking about? Uh, hundreds of milliwatts. Okay, yeah. So I think what what the problem, of course, is the flicker noise, right? Yeah. So a lot of people are having an issue with the flicker noise, and uh, I'm a bit puzzled about that. But at in the end, the at the end of the day, the nice thing about flicker noise is that it's very low frequency, so it actually looks like a very slowly varying offset voltage and there are techniques to take care of offset voltages. So for this project, I think, you know, to make it, for it to make sense for you guys to actually use the theory you learn in this class as opposed to being spice monkeys, I think it's better if we just set KF equal to zero and meet the specs without the flicker noise. Now, if you do want to try it to meet it with the flicker noise, you know, we can consider that an optional extra section to your design, what techniques you use to fight the flicker noise uh, but otherwise, to you know, to turn in your project, I think it's better to keep the flicker noise out for now, with the assumption that, of course, you could take care of it with some offset cancellation circuitry. Okay. Any questions or comments about that? If you came in late today and you just missed what I said, definitely ask somebody. <laughs> you don't want to miss this one. All right. Questions or comments? Oh yeah, the final exam. I, I've also decided that uh, the final exam is going to be open book, uh, open notes, and uh, someone suggested please don't have one problem, you know, have multiple problems to take out dependencies. And so I'll, I'll try to make it a few different problems by your request, not one problem. And uh, the, the, the problems will probably be a little bit more design oriented than the midterm. So the midterm was pure did you understand the material? Do you know how to apply it? Do you recognize these circuits? Final will be more, a little bit more on the design side, and so emphasize a little bit more uh, the second half of the course. Okay. And as far as material goes for the exam, so this, because this is the last week of instruction, obviously everything up until the last lecture, Thursday's lecture. All right. So, <clears throat> oh yeah, and then office hours, because I'm not here next week, no office hours next week, and what I'm going to do is hold uh, office hours on the Monday of the following week, which is, I believe, a day or two before the final exam. So I'll have like two hours of office hours to address your last minute questions. And if you need to contact me, th you can reach me through email for next week. All right, we're going to do a new topic today. We're going to talk about MOS sample and hold. And this is a circuit that, in effect, we've really been using all along, but we've always drawn it in this way. We've just used ideal switches. And so today we're going to look at what happens when you put in a real switch, a real MOSFET device. Um, when you're using an ideal switch like this, as you remember, the idea is that when the switch is closed, we charge up this capacitor C to the input voltage. And uh, when we open the switch, 
we actually can hold the last value sampled. The last value of Vn is actually sampled on this capacitor, and now we can use that in our uh, post, you know, processing stages that follow. Excuse me. <laughs> Unfortunately, when we use a, a real switch, life is not so good. So with a real switch, there's several issues, and this is going to take the whole lecture to talk about these issues. One of them you already know about, right? I'm not going to beat you over the head again with KT over C noise. Uh, you know that because of the finite resistance of the switch, the operation of sampling, we get noise aliasing, and the total integrated noise is going to be KT over C. So first of all, the way you would size this circuit would be typically in order to make sure that the thermal noise of the circuit is well below the noise that you care about, for instance, the quantization noise of an A to D stage that's going to follow, uh, then you would size your C big enough so that the thermal noise is well below the other, let's say, noise floor, the quantization noise floor for that kind of application. The other issue with uh, a real transistor here is that resistance means there's going to be an RC delay constant, right? So this is going to be, um, it's going to take some time for, for us to settle, which means that we have to wait. And that limits the bandwidth of this operation. So if I want to, to do a sample and hold faster and faster, I've got to somehow make this circuit faster and faster. And if the capacitance is fixed, right, by resolution, that means making the switch larger and larger, right, to make its resistance smaller and smaller. And as I do that, uh, I run into some problems. Anybody guess what some of those problems are going to be without reading the slide? <laughs> what, what, what are some issues with a big switch? Big switch has low resistance. That's good. Yes, Christian. Gate leakage. Yeah, the big. You know, you're already thinking of you know advanced technologies. As I make the switch bigger and bigger, it's going to leak more, right? So I'm going to have. Uh, all sorts of leakage currents in that device which scale with area and if those leakage currents are substantial enough they could discharge this capacitor or introduce enough error on the capacitor uh, as to you know again go above the noise floor that we care about but what other issues do we have with the big switch charge injection yeah charge injection we're going to spend some time talking about this but the, the, the basic idea is that this switch stores some charge it stores it in its leakage capacitances, right? It's uh, not leakage, excuse me, in its overlap capacitances. It also stores it in the channel. And that charge has to go somewhere. And as, that, as I make the switch bigger, that intrinsic charge and extrinsic charge gets bigger and bigger. And unfortunately, that charge can appear or disappear from this capacitor C, which makes our sample and hold less accurate. So we're limited in how big we can make this switch ultimately by charge injection. A couple other more subtle effects. Uh, one very subtle effect here is that the switch resistance is actually a function of the input voltage. All right, why is that? Well, the switch resistance is a function of how much inversion I have, right? The amount of inversion I have is the gate voltage minus the source voltage minus the threshold voltage. Well, the source voltage here in triode region is really around Vn, plus or minus, you know, tens of millivolts. Uh, so Vn really determines the amount of inversion I have, which in, f in turn determines the amount of switch resistance I have. Incidentally, where, where is the source of this transistor? Anybody? Is it here or here? Anybody want to? Okay. Debo, do you have your hand up? Where is lower potential? Yeah, it really doesn't matter, right? We, we know that our, it could be either. And uh, this MOS transistor is really a symmetric device, unless it's a special device like a power transistor or something. For the most part, most transistors we deal with are symmetric. So the source is really the terminal with the lower potential. And if our input signal is bigger than the last value that we sampled, then the source is going to be here. If it's smaller, <clears throat> then it's going to be here. So continuously, the point where we call the source is switching back and forth. So the source is just the point that has more inversion. 
And because this is a switch, right, it's, it's actually, this is going to be more or less uh, a short circuit, right? It's going to be some current flowing, so it's not quite a short circuit. But VDS is going to be small. It's going to be tens of millivolts. And so really, what's the source, what's the drain really doesn't even matter. We can really think of this as almost an equal potential across here. Um, and it's interesting to note that in SPICE, SPICE doesn't even know where the source of drain is. Inside the code, you know, how does SPICE decide where the source and drain is? Well, you tell it, right? You tell it, you know, drain, gate, source, body. Well, how does SPICE deal with that? What happens when the transistor switches sides? Isn't that wreak havoc with SPICE? Anybody look at SPICE code? <laughs> Well, inside SPICE, it does exactly what you would expect. Uh, it says, if VDS is greater than 0, then this is the drain. Otherwise, if VDS is negative, I'm going to do a swap. And internally, there's a swap code. And so it swaps the source and the drain. Now, that sounds great, right? Because it means you have half the equations. Uh, in, in fact, at the end of the day, this introduces an error. Because you can think of there's an if statement in your program and depending on the numerical resolution of your computer, when something is greater than zero or less than zero, right, that's a floating point operation. That depends on how accurate your computer is. And so if your VDS gets small enough, all of a sudden it swaps. And you can think of that as like an absolute value function, if you like. So you know, IDS, would, really it should cross zero like this, but to make the code simple, it does something like this. It does an absolute value function. And so really the, the slope should be smooth right around VDS equals zero, but because we have this absolute value function, we know the slope is not defined at VDS equals zero. So this ends up introducing a lot of distortion into our circuit, and whenever you have switches and you run a distortion analysis, be very careful. If your switch is biased around VDS equal to zero, the distortion you see may not actually be real. It may be due to this effect. Now, that's if you're using what's called the source reference transistor models. If you call, if you use actually a body reference transistor model, then internally, uh, it it never does this drain source swap. It always calculates everything for the source and drain separately, and you don't run into this problem. Okay. So a little bit of a detour, but an important point nevertheless. So the switch resistance we can see now is clearly a function of V in, and that means the settling time of the circuit depends on V in. And that's going to give rise to distortion. So we'll talk about that. Okay, questions or comments? All right. If you didn't get any everything, don't worry. That's this is just a preview. I'm going to go through step by step now. Okay, noise you guys have seen before. Uh, this is just how I would size my capacitor. I want, let's say, the thermal noise to be below my quantization noise. And in an earlier lecture, we calculated the RMS value of our quantization noise is the uh, LSB squared divided by 12. And so then my capacitor has to be bigger than this quantity. Uh, the LSB size is the full scale voltage divided by 2 to the b, where b is the number of bits, okay, minus 1. So if you plug in some numbers here, you know, not knowing anything about your circuit, if you need, let's say, 12 bits of accuracy, you can calculate that you need at least 0.8 picofarads of capacitance. All right? So who cares how you implement the rest of your circuits? If you've got this anywhere in your circuit, if you have this MOS sampler hold, and you need this certain resolution, you're going to have to make your capacitor big enough. Which actually may puzzle you because if you have a pretty good stereo system at home, it might have 20-bit A to D converter on it, right? So what's happening there? How do you, in, in systems that claim to have such high resolution, how could they possibly in, incorporate these huge capacitors, right? 50 nanofarads of capacitance. Anybody have a guess? Think of the settling time if you had a 50 nanosecond capacitance. 
right? Yes. Do you use some kind of noise shaping thing? And yeah, this is something. Kind of low, low rates too compared to what we. Yeah, you either go really slow, right? Crawl, you know, sample at one hertz or you know, kilohertz. Uh, and there are applications where that's needed, right? You might be designing a monitoring system that needs to check the temperature very accurately every, you know, millisecond or every second. An application like that, that would be fine. Or if you're, if you're looking for seismic activity, and there's tiny vibrations, right? You're going to process the signal and take out the vibrations due to the, you know, me banging my hand on the table, and try to figure out if there's any background vib low frequency vibration. That would require lots of accuracy. Uh, but very slow again, because you know these kinds of things happen relatively slow. But as you're you're right, if, if you want to go fast, you got to play another trick, and this is what you're going to learn in 247, is you're going to use oversampling techniques. So you're going to actually sample much faster than you need to, and that basically spreads out your quantization noise over a wider bandwidth. And so if you're if you only care about a smaller bandwidth, then in effect you've re, you know you've divided your noise by a factor of n. So if I oversample by 100, effectively I could reduce this capacitor by a factor of 100. Um, and then you mentioned noise shaping. Well, I can be even more clever. I can do things in such a, I can oversample in such a way that my noise is even shaped. And I can make the low frequency noise be smaller than the high frequency noise. Total integrated noise still has to be the same, but I can shape where that noise goes. And so this is uh, something you're going to learn about in 247. All right, so one of the issues about using a MOSFET as a switch is its resistance. And in the off state, what we really want is an open circuit. We don't want the input voltage to influence the, the value that we've sampled on our capacitor. So hopefully, our off is infinity, right? Very large off resistance, total isolation between the input and the output. Can I get that? Is that reasonable? Well, uh, no. I mean, Christian already gave us one of the reasons. One is that there's going to be leakage currents in our device, and ultimately the, you know, the input-output may be coupled to through some of these leakage currents. We've got. Um, more importantly, though, you know, what does it mean to turn off your device? We know that our device is not some digital switch; it's actually an analog switch. And when you turn it off, when you go below threshold, it's still on but it's just a really, really weak device. It's in the sub-threshold regime. And so it conducts current in sub-threshold, right? And for every 60 millivolts I go below the threshold voltage, the current goes down a factor of 10x. So that tells you, you know, if you're sensitive to currents at a certain level, how, much, how many volts you have to go below threshold to actually effectively turn off that device. But probably a lot more importantly is the capacitive coupling I have in my device. So even if I turn this device off, I have capacitances from each node to every other node. And let's say that I have a, uh, let's say I have this picture here. In this case, what what's causing the the problems with isolation? Which capacitor is it? Let's call this CGS just for the sake of argument. Doesn't really matter. Seagate to drain, and let's call this CDS. So, which capacitance is a problem in this picture? So this V is, let's say, much less than the threshold voltage. So the switch is off. Which cap would you worry about? Easy question, right? It's too easy, so you're shy to answer it. It's You'd be embarrassed to to answer such a simple question. <laughs> All right, Kevin, what do you think? Uh, 
You've got a big smile on your face. <laughs> Can you use a mic? I think CGD, because it might. Um... Well, remember, we're, we're worried about isolation here. So I want, I don't want changes of the input to affect this constant voltage that I sampled. Okay, then it'll be CGS. CGS. C. C. D S. We got two out of three. Okay. <laughs> Great. Three out of three. CDS. That's right. CDS is the only one that matters because. I've got a constant voltage on the gate, and it's a voltage source. So this is actually grounding my gate. So any signal here that leaks through CGS just goes to ground, right? And because this voltage is constant, I don't couple any signal through Seagate to drain. So it's really CDS that matters. What is CDS when the transistor is off? Should be more or less zero, right? It's got to be pretty small. I mean, if you look at your transistor, You've got some capacitance, some junction capacitance, right? And then some body resistance. And you've also got, let's say, junction to junction capacitance. So these, you know, if you get to a really short channel device, you can, might start worrying about these, these capacitors, right? Especially this one is, as these junctions get very close together. But these should be pretty small capacitors, right? And so that should give us pretty good isolation. In other words, if this is 10 picofarads, and this capacitance is on the order of a femtofarad, right, the, the signal levels that are going to leak through are going to be t pretty damn small, right? Factor of 1,000 down. And so if that factor of 1,000 is how many bits? About 10 bits, right? So if you're designing a 10-bit converter, hey, factor of 1,000 matters. That, that's an error I need to worry about. If it's an 8-bit converter, forget it. It's not an issue. Well, life isn't so simple, right? Why is it that, in fact, Kevin was right? I have to worry about CGS and Seagate to drain. There's always going to be a, a fine and resistance, so you have an RC time cost. Exactly. You know, whoever gives you a voltage source, right? Nobody. You're going to get, this is going to be driven by, let's say, an inverter or something like that. And it has some finite switch, you know, on resistance, right? And so really, there's going to be an R here. And so now, low frequency signals are shorted to VDD or ground, right? In this case, ground. Um, but high frequency signals, they see a high impedance here. They see a lower impedance here. And so high frequency signals will couple through. And so you do have to worry about CGS and Seagate to drain. Now, I should also mention that, you know, this is not the only source. You know, these are not the only capacitors we have to worry about. What other capacitors do we have to worry about? In fact, if you're not careful, those other capacitors could dominate. This is something that's up to you. Anybody? Debo? Bulk capacitances. Bulk capacitances? DB and CSP. Yeah, they, we've got them here, right? What about wiring capacitor? Yeah, just your layout. Layout capacitances. So think about, your, your, you know, you lay out your transistor, and the core transistor is great. You've minimized, let's say, your source and your drain. So you've minimized all the overlap capacitances, but then you're kind of sloppy in your layout, and you come here and you cross these wires. And in this area, you produce each CDS, right? This drain source. So this produces CDS. And you might think, oh, that's going to be a tiny capacitor. But what if you have this as a unit element, and then you have a thousand of these? And so that you know, 0.1 femtofarads is now a huge capacitance. So be careful. Layout is very important, and that's up to you. You can't blame the model equations or anybody else. You're going to take the blame for that. All right, so let's say you're, you're designing this and you need 12 bits of accuracy, and you just find that no matter how careful you are, 
this, oh, these capacitances are large enough so that you're not getting your 12 bits accuracy. How do you solve the problem? How do you improve the isolation between the input and the output? True. Two switches in series? Yeah. If one's not good enough, use another one, right? So the idea is what's all sometimes called a T-switch, because it looks like a T, obviously. So this is my sampling capacitor, and this is my input voltage. And I still have my capacitors. Okay. And So on one cycle, I have these switches both on. This is off. So let's call this clock, clock, and clock bar. And when this switch is off, these two series switches just look like one, si one switch, right, just like before. They're both in triode region, and my ch input charge is up to here. Then during the next cycle, I turn these two off, and I turn this one on. And the idea is that if a signal from here tries to get to the output, right, the path it has to take is it has to go through these capacitors or equivalently through this capacitance and then from this point to the output. So if this switch were not here, I would get the same voltage divider effect. Now I've got these capacitors in series. I get a factor of two improvement. Big deal. It's not a factor of you know, 2 to the third power, which I need to get to 12 bits, let's say. So that's not going to do it, but now I have this extra switch here, and this switch grounds this node. So, so this considerably improves the isolation, because now if a signal tries to get to the output, well, it sees a short, it sees a, a short circuit to ground here, and so actually most of the signal will flow to this node. So the input now has a choice between going into a ground or going through these tiny capacitors. So mega ohms versus few ohms. It'll take a few ohms, right? Tens of ohms. So this will considerably imp improve the isolation. Question? Yeah, what what happened in the, uh, during that time when basically the, the switch in the middle grounds the signal? Don't you feed through the, the grounding? Like, if assuming you have a high voltage there, and then you have a step at, the, at that middle point, so you feed it through the output as well, right? So your concern is that when I turn this switch on, there's a voltage here, roughly V in, and I've got to discharge that. And you're worried that that's going to discharge this guy. Yeah, that's a good concern. Um, what you do, of course, is you control the timing very carefully. So you want to make sure these switches are turned off, right, in such a way that when you discharge this node, you don't pull charge off of here. But you still have the capacitor Capacitance of the second transistor. So it's, isn't it the same effect as before? Um, so you, you have a good point here. So if I put a step on this node, it's going to couple to the output. Yeah, it's definitely an issue. Um, you have to really time this correctly. So what you really want to do is time these switches in such a way that when you're turning this off, you're actually pulling current from this source as opposed to here. So if you order these right, right, you can turn it off, pull it low first from here, and then turn this one off. So I think you can probably time things to make it work. Yeah, Debo? Uh, is it this similar to say this clock feed through? This yeah, this is exactly what we were talking about over here as well, right? Yeah. So in this case, it's not the input that's getting to the output; it's the clock. You know, this this is actually probably less of a concern than the input feeding through. Why why is that? Why do I make that claim? Okay. Yes, Jesse. The clock happens the same way in every cycle, so you can think of it as an offset. Very good, yeah. So the clock signal always goes through the same transition. Um, but this point 
is actually charged to VIN, right? So this produces a signal dependent uh, error. That's bad. <clears throat> the clock feed through, which Debo points out, which is a very similar effect, right? This voltage steps, and I get a little step over here, uh, is always happening in the same way, so you can think of it as deterministic. And if it's a, if I have a differential circuit, it's going to happen on both sampling capacitors, and then it's going to get rejected by my common mode of my amplifier. Okay. Good. All right. So the next thing, so so maybe you need this, but probably not. Actually, this is very rare. One of the problems, of course, is now you have two switches in series, increases the resistance. Um, Clocking waveforms, as you guys very smartly pointed out, are going to get complicated. Um, so let's go back to our simple switch. So the next question is, uh, what is the resistance of the switch, and how much does it vary with uh, the input voltage? So this is a very simple circuit. I have a switch here, and I connect a small voltage across VDS and just measure the current through VDS as I change the input voltage. And this is an NMOS switch, this is a PMOS switch. And so I can look at the current in each one separately and figure out the, um, the resistance of that switch. And here it is. So this is a SPICE simulation. And so this is the NMOS switch. And just as you would expect, when the input is low, the switch resistance is relatively low. In this case, for a 10 over 0.35 micron device, about 150 ohms. Uh, as I increase the input voltage, though, the resistance is going up. Why is that? Well, we just talked about it. The inversion level is going down, right? The inversion level depends on VGS, right? And so as this voltage goes up, I have less VGS, and so I have less inversion charge, and so the switch has more and more resistance. In fact, at some point, wh where does this go if I keep drawing this? It's quadratically increasing. It just keeps increasing, right? Because at some point, if I go above a threshold voltage away from v VG, right? This is VG here. If the input voltage comes within a threshold of VG, there is no inversion, right? And so it looks like, in a simple model, an infinite resistance. I have two back-to-back -back junctions, and then it's just the leakage currents through those junctions that determines the resistance. But it's gigaohms, right? So off the scale. So NMOS switch apparently works well if our input signal is small. And in a given application, you might say, I can tolerate up to 200 ohms of resistance based on settling time. And so if I'm going to use an NMOS switch, that means I can only have an input voltage up to a volt. Right? So that really hurts our dynamic range. So now we have to redo our KT over C calculations, assuming a one volt input as opposed to, let's say, three volts, which we, would, we went so we worked so hard to design out of our amplifier, right? And of course, the PMOS device is symmetric, right? It's going to be it's also going to increase as the input decreases for the same exact reason. And so it might have an input range on the high side. But if essentially, it has the same problem. So what's the solution? Put them in parallel, right? So if I, why not use both in parallel, right? So that's called a CMOS switch. And the, the resistance of our CMOS switch is a parallel combination. Why is it a little bit higher over here than over here? Frank? Yeah, very good. Mobility, right? This this point here is determined by the mobility of the holes. Here it's determined by the mobility of the electrons. So it's going to be a little bit asymmetric. But the good news is that you know over the whole input range, it's below 200 ohms. So now, again, I have full-scale input. All right. So we talked also about the speed of these switches. And the math is very simple, right? 
if if you assume the circuit is linear, then when the switch is on, this is a fixed resistor, and you know we have exponential settling. What's wrong with this model? Anything wrong with this? Well, we just went through a lot of trouble to say the resistance really is a function of V in, right? So instead of a simple first order differential equation, we get ourselves a nasty nonlinear differential equation. And if you want to learn how to solve that, come take 242. But for now, we're going to make life easy. We're just going to say this is a constant resistance. Okay. So if it were a constant resistance, then uh, you can ask your maybe seventh grade brother to come do this calculation, right? It's so simple. It's just exponential settling. And so you say, how much time do I need to wait? Well, it depends on the resolution that you want. Let's say this is the LSB. Plug in a couple numbers. And you get this simple equation that if you want to settle within a certain accuracy of B bits, and this is your sampling capacitor, and this is the sampling rate, this is the, the how fast you want to settle, then your resistance needs to be at least less than this quantity. So as you would expect, inversely proportional to the frequency, the faster you go, the smaller you have to make the resistance to make the settling time faster. Of course, inversely proportional to capacitance. Uh, and capacitance is also a function of number of bits. So if you really like, you can come in and do a KT over C substitution here and make this a function of just speed and bits, right? And so at the end of the day, uh, this resistance value is also pretty much determined by how fast you want to go in your resolution. There's no way around it. Uh, why is it that we want this resistance to be much smaller than? We just calculated that, you know, you know, maybe we just need to be a little bit less than the quantization error. Why be a lot less than? Oh, simple answer. There's all sorts of errors that are going to come into play. And, you know, this you don't want this one to dominate. This one's easy. We can take care of it. We make our switch big enough, the resistance is small enough, and we don't think about it anymore. And we worry about the bigger fish, right? Got bigger fish to fry. So here, here's some numbers to plug in uh, just to give you an idea. 14 bits we need, if you go back and look at that chart, you need about 13 picofarads of capacitance, and let's say we want to sample at 100 megahertz. Uh, then the switch resistance has to be less than 40 ohms, much less than 40 ohms. Okay. Well, the um, let, let's look a little bit about at the nonlinearity of the switch. So, because the switch is in triode region. Uh, Let's use our square law model. This is the current. This is the voltage. And the small signal resistance at any given point right, is just this slope. And this slope, if you take a derivative here, you guys have probably done these calculations a few dozen times. You probably know the answer by heart. The answer is 1 over mu C ox, W over L, <clears throat> basically the amount of inversion you get through that device. So VDD minus VT minus the input voltage. And clearly, as V in approaches VDD minus VT, we get infinite resistance, just as we would expect. That's actually happening right here, right at that point. The device is about to go into saturation. And we, you know, our simple model says in saturation, it's a current source, has infinite output impedance. Of course, there's going to be a finite slope here. But it's going to be too high. Um, one nice thing you can do is you could take this equation and write it in a normalized form. You could say, well, if Vn were equal to 0, this term goes away, and let's call that R0. So this is the resistance, the best resistance you get, right? And then as Vn becomes larger, I can you know, factor this term. I can pull this out. That gives me an R0. And then on the denominator, I get 1 minus Vn over Vdd minus Vt. So this, this equation here is a nice little equation that tells you how much R on varies as a function of Vn. Okay? And same equation applies, of course, for the P-switch with some absolute value signs, if you like. Uh, and if you have both switches in parallel, like a CMOS switch, uh, 
you can also just put them in parallel. All right, so what happens if I take a switch where R is now a function of V in and put a capacitor here? Let's say I'm sampling a sine wave. So I'm sampling this different points, right? And then I do some digital signal processing at this end to see what I actually got. What am I going to get? Let's say I plot, plot the spectrum. Um, this is FS, right? This is FS over 2. This is DC. And let's say my sine wave on the input is at this frequency. This is the input. What am I going to see on the output? Well, hopefully you're going to see a sine wave as well, right? going to have the sine wave appearing at the output roughly at the same frequency. What else am I going to see? Okay. Who took 142? Someone from 142 want to venture a guess? I'm going to say harmonics. Yeah, you're going to see harmonic distortion. Right? Because this is a nonlinear switch, and basically we know that nonlinearities produce harmonics. Spent a few weeks in 142 talking about that. Uh, so harmonics, okay, you could say, well, that's okay. I'm just going to use this bandwidth. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm going to basically make sure that you know I, I filter everything above this frequency. And okay, I, I take instead of having the full bandwidth that I thought I was going to have, I'm going to have less bandwidth. But I get around this problem of distortion. Is that true? Maybe someone else from 142 can shed some light on this. Because would that work? Can I just filter out those harmonics? That's fine. I mirror, right, I have some complex filter. It takes care of everything. Well, let me put it to you this way. How interesting is it to sample a sine wave? <laughs> is anybody going to give you money to build a sine wave sampler? No. They want you to sample something like a voice signal or a heartbeat. What's going to happen when I put a heartbeat through the circuit? there's any distortion, <clears throat> be careful, right? Hire a good lawyer. Um, well, if you're going to get intermodulation distortion, right? So if I have, you know, the, the classic way of describing it is if I put in two tones, then I get intermods, right? And the intermods actually appear right next to my signals. And so if I try to filter out the harmonics, fine, you filtered out your harmonics, but you still have these intermodulation products which are nearly as big as your harmonics. And that's just two tones. By Fourier analysis, we know that we can decompose any signal into a bunch of tones. And so every pairs of tones are going to produce second order intermodulations. Every triple pairs, uh, triple, triplets are going to do triple beat and quadruple beat. And you're going to get basically an ugly mess. And in fact, here's a simulation. Um, let me zoom in on the equation and then the graph. So this equation is very simple. So just assuming that the settling time is a function of the input voltage, right? This is not a solution to the nonlinear differential equation, by the way. Oh, sorry to disappoint you. This is just saying, ah, it's going to look more or less exponential, and the time constant is going to vary. So OK, if you do that, if you just plug that into MATLAB, this is what you get. And what's plotted here is the noise floor is actually the quantization noise. And it's not the thermal noise. So probably the thermal noise is down here. Of course, MATLAB doesn't know about thermal noise, so that's OK. So the quantization noise uh, pretty much sets the noise, noise floor for our system, right? That's the accuracy of our system. and these distortion products, in this case, this is actually a real case. Uh, if we wait 10 time constants, 
then you know this is the kind of distortion we're going to get assuming this kind of settling behavior and you can see that these harmonics are actually not that far down I mean you get so this is about 40 dB down right maybe 40 50 dB down that's maybe 8 9 bits of resolution so if you had designed a converter and you're hoping to get a noise floor of 100 dB guess what you're not going to get it the distortion is now determining your noise floor and so any signal above this is strong enough than these distortion products but if you go below this it could potentially get clobbered by your distortion that's a bad situation right you don't want your distortion to set the noise floor these are also sometimes called spurs and if you don't know what a spur is go look at a cowboy boot sometime um, what can I do to, to, to improve the situation something simple right let's say that uh, somebody from a university across the bay designed the circuit and you have to live with it they didn't consider nonlinearity and it's got all these spurs and but you still have to use the circuit you're forced manager says there's no time to redesign you just have to use it any way to make these things go away something simple well maybe you can do something very simple just go slower right because if I if I go slower if I wait more time I expect the distortion to go down why is that So in fact, here's proof that it works. Instead of waiting 10 time constants here, I'm going to wait 20 time constants. And now the spurs are down to like minus 70 dB. The this, this second harmonic's down to minus 70 dB. Why, why is that? Well, it's it's quite simple because the longer you wait, the more accurately you settle, right? So, let's say this is the settling time when the input is large, and so the settling time is slow, and then let's say the input is small now. Let's say it goes down again, and now we have a small input, so it settles very fast. So that's the fast settling, this is the slow settling. Well, if I wait all the way out here then it doesn't matter if you're fast or slow because eventually you get close enough you get within an LSB so I'm, I'm here I'm gonna wait way too long but it doesn't matter so here I'm gonna get you know a gazillion time constants here I'm, I'm gonna let's say five or six time constants so at the end of the day that time dependent settling goes away and that helps a lot and you see it in the simulation that the harmonic products are lower. If I wait you know, maybe 40 time constants, then they're below the noise floor. I don't even see them. Okay? Well, unfortunately, not everybody likes to go slow. In fact, people like to go fast. So we've got to do something to solve this problem. And the way to solve the problem is, one, you can over-design the switches. Make them very large and so that under all conditions even the worst case input levels the switch resistance uh, is, is low enough that you settle fast enough and, 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 and as we talked about that means increased charge injection and increased clock feed through and also increased cl clock power because ultimately I've got to turn these switches on and off and you guys know from digital that that takes CV squared F power so speed is always expensive um, another solution is you say okay you know use your complementary switches use the NMOS and the PMOS together that should help they kind of compensate each other right so if we go back to this picture 
well, not only is the switch lower, switch resistance lower, but also its variation is less, right? And it's really this variation in resistance that's producing the problem. If the switch resistance were high but constant, there would be no distortion. So complementary switches actually help a lot. Something else you could do is you could basically just operate your, always operate with a small signal, right? So basically make your full scale voltage much smaller than VDD. So VDD is 10 volts, full scale voltage make it 200 millivolts, right? So now the signals are always small. I can just use an NMOS switch and the switch resistance won't vary that much. Well, first of all, it means you have to have a huge voltage, right? If you don't have a huge voltage, then you're going to have some noise problems, right? So if you have a 1 volt supply, now you're talking 10 millivolts, and boy, that flicker noise is going to kill you, right? So noise is going to be a problem. So all, all these issues really come together, and the really probably the, the cleanest solution is to say, wait a minute, let me somehow sample my switch, let me design my switch that, so instead of having the input control the inversion level, let me always guarantee that my switch has the same level of inversion. And this is called constant VGS sampling. So here's a picture of what it looks like. When my switch is off, it's just like before. I connect this gate to ground. But when my switch is on, if I could somehow put a battery between the source and the gate, right? Instead of so instead of referencing things to ground, I reference them to my source. Then my VGS is always equal to VDD. And since VGS, so VGS is equal to VDD. That means R on is a function of VDD and not a function of V in. So that means a distortion would go away completely. Would it go away completely? Let's see how awake you guys are. you could somehow connect the volt battery between gate and just basically if you could build this right For who cares how it's going to actually be done but let's say you could do this would this problem of R on variation go away for the most part right because VGS is now constant but besides VGS what else controls the amount of inversion in the channel VDS also changes well VDS is practically zero right this is in triode region. But what else? VPS? Yeah, there's going to be body effect, right? So, sure, VGS is constant, but VT can vary, right? As the input changes, I'm changing my source voltage, right? Which means I'm changing my threshold voltage, which means that R on does vary. So, if, if the body is tied to a constant voltage, you're going to see that variation. So really, if you have the option in this case, definitely connect the body and source together. Okay, question? How bad is this nonlinearity compared to the normal nonlinearities we see, like the GM nonlinearity? Um, it's bad because there's no feedback around it. The GM nonlinearity, you put feedback around it and it goes away. Without feedback? Well, the GM nonlinearity is coming from the same source, right? The equations are almost the same. If I look at my GM of my transistor, it's actually the same exact equation. So the GM of the transistor in saturation is equal to GDS in triode. So GM varies with input signal in the same way that GDS does. So it's on the same order of magnitude. But the mechanism by which it produces distortion is very different because now it's producing distortion based on your sampling time. So this nonlinearity becomes important the faster you try to sample. Okay, it's, so it's it's a little bit apples and oranges to compare them. Okay, so if we can get rid of the, the body effect, then this solution looks very promising. The only problem is, how do you do this?
Any ideas? I've seen this a few times in this class. Ideal voltage sources, not so convenient. Capacitor is very convenient, right? So somehow I need to charge a capacitor to VDD, and then I need to apply it here. Okay. So here's what the circuit looks like. Here's the input voltage. You know, when the input is low, the gate voltage is going to be v VDD. That's simple. I can do that. Well, what if the input is high? As the input goes up, we can see that the gate voltage has to actually go to VN plus VDD. So this distance is always VDD. And that means that potentially I need to actually apply a VG, which is two times VDD. That's a little bit tricky, right? Am I going to break down when I apply a, a gate voltage of 2 VDD? Okay, VDD is usually the br breakdown voltage of the transistor. You know, of course, there's a, a safety factor. If you hit, you know, if you go 1% above VDD, you're not going to fry your transistor. But, you know, a factor of 2 above VDD, that's pretty aggressive. Am I going to fry my transistors? Yes. Isn't the source and drain going up together with the gate voltage as well? Yeah, it's not the absolute voltage that matters. It's the VGS that matters, right? It's the voltage you put across the oxide if we're talking about oxide breakdown. So in this case, VGS is still always VDD. So it's going to be okay. It's not, not a problem. There are diodes in your circuit, right? They're usually off. You could break down those diodes. You could get reverse breakdown on your diodes. But usually that margin is a lot larger. The, the, probably the, the biggest worry in these circuits is the oxide breakdown. Okay. So here's a circuit that, that solves this problem. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see. Let's zoom into just the circuit a little bit. And it's complicated, right? We went from MOS capacitor to MOS, 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 and capacitor. So, so it looks very complicated. But if we break it down step by step, it's actually not too bad. So at the end of the day, this is our This is our circuit. Everything else is just generating this floating, sometimes called a bootstrapped gate voltage, uh, VGS voltage. So what I do is uh, somewhere in this circuit, apparently there's a capacitor that's going to get charged to VDD, and then that capacitor is going to get applied across here. And if you look carefully, you can see that capacitor is here. So this capacitor is somehow going to get charged to VDD, and then it's going to get applied between this node and this node. So this is going to be my VGS. And, and it's going to basically float this node potentially up to 2 VDD. If the input goes to VDD, VDD plus a VDD will push this all the way up to twice VDD. So to analyze the circuit, really what you should do is break it down. And this part is actually almost separate. And all it's doing is this, this circuit, if you've seen it before, it's called a clock multiplier. And uh, if you haven't seen it before, let's look at it. So what this circuit does is it takes, uh, takes my VDD voltage and doubles it. So it's just a voltage multiplier. And it, it's actually one of these uh, charge pump circuits where you connect charge up capacitors and then connect them together to build up a higher voltage. Um, it doesn't do it in one cycle. It takes a few cycles for it to actually reach steady state. Uh, and we, we can kind of see how that happens. Uh, first of all, forget these resistors, right? These are just for spice. And so what happens is that you have your clock, right? This is your clock, and it comes in here. And so this is your clock waveform. And for the sake of argument, let's say our clock waveform is high. Let's say it's 3 volts. So this is a 3 volt technology. If this point is 3 volts, this is another inverter, this point will be 0 volts. And let's say that initially this capacitor is discharged, right? So this has 0 volts. That also applies 3 volts to this gate, which turns on this transistor. And so this capacitor gets charged up to 3 volts, right? 
this node gets pulled up, this node gets pulled down, and we get three volts in here. All right, so what happens on the negative cycle? So on the next cycle, <clears throat> use a different colored pen. This point goes to zero volts. This point goes to three volts. This point, what voltage does it go up to? Six volts, right? Three volts plus three volts, six volts. And so now this transistor turns on really hard, right? So this transistor turns on hard and uh, has plenty of VGS. And so, but remember, this point is always at three volts, right? And, and this point is at three volts. So VGS is three volts, it's not six volts. So this transistor turns on and pulls this node high, right? And so this capacitor now charges also up to 3 volts, right? So this point is pulled up to 3 volts by this switch. VDD is only 3 volts. And so now I charge up this capacitor also to 3 volts. And as you go through the cycle, you'll find that in steady state, what happens is that this voltage here at 6 volts is maintained. Alternatively, as these capacitors are turned on and off, charge gets transferred and within a couple cycles, you know, here's a simulation result, you can see that this node here is multiplied up to close to six volts. Not quite six volts. You know, there's there's some VDS effects that, that come into play. Uh, there's actually it's mostly charge sharing. I mean you have fortunately you have some capacitance here which pulls this down. But uh, as long as this the ratio of this cap to this cap is much larger this thing can go up to up to twice VDD. So that's all the circuit is doing is multiplying our VDD. Okay. Now, why do we need that? Well, <clears throat> we need that large VDD, two times VDD, to, to, in order to charge up this capacitor. So this is that critical capacitor that we talked about before. This is the capacitor that we're going to put in parallel with VGS. And the way I'm going to charge this up to VDD is I'm going to have this transistor pull this node up to VDD and this transistor go to ground. That will charge this transistor up to VDD. And I have a very large gate voltage here so that I always guarantee I have enough inversion with this trans transistor so that I can pull it all the way up. If I didn't have two VDD, right, I couldn't pull this all the way to supply. I'd have to pull it up to one threshold of supply. But here I can pull it all the way up to supply because I have plenty of gate voltage. So the rest of the circuit, trivial, right? It just generates this 2VDD. So really this is our circuit. So now it's a lot simpler, right? Yes? So why not use a PMOS to pull it all the way up to VDD? Uh, well, you want to be able to charge this relatively quickly because I'm going to, in the next cycle, this charge is going to get shared with my VGS. So on each cycle, I need to recharge this back up to VDD. And so I like to use an NMOS device. It's a good question. Okay. Yeah, uh, it looks like you are introducing a lot more uh, transistors. Does that kind of introduce more noise? At the end of the day, you get KT over C noise. That's a nice thing about these kinds of circuits, right? Um, because, to think about it, when I actually, at the very end, all I'm going to do is connect this capacitor in parallel with VGS. And it's a capacitor, right? And the capacitor has no noise, right, on its own. Once I sample its, the value onto this capacitor, what, what noise do I get? Well, I get KT over C noise, right? So the KT over C noise of this capacitor now comes in on VGS. Now, as long as that voltage is bigger than the device, right? So this KT over C noise is going to modulate the on resistance of this device. That's going to be a very small effect, right? Because it's going to be, you know, microvolts of modulation. So that will produce some kind of nonlinearity, but very small nonlinearity. Okay? That's a, that's a good question. Okay, so in this state, apparently all we're doing is, you know, these switches are off, so the input is disconnected from the sampling capacitor. Uh, this node is off. During this cycle, all we're doing is charging up this capacitor up to VDD. Okay? And then in the next cycle, um, 
this switch is on, this switch is on, and we're just taking this capacitor and connecting it in parallel. And that looks a lot like the original circuit that we wanted, a battery connected between this node and VG. So VG here is bootstrapped, and it can go as high as 2VDD. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a simulation of the circuit. It works as you would expect. You can see that as the input voltage goes high, the gate voltage also tracks and goes high enough so that uh, you have almost a full VDD uh, across that switch. But more importantly, it doesn't have to be full VDD, right? As long as it's large enough, right? And as long as it does not vary with signal amplitude. So this amplitude is the same as this amplitude, which means it's not going to generate distortion. Okay. Here's a, the complete circuit again with all the complications. Um, don't worry, I won't put something like this on the final and say analyze it. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, you know there's several papers. Uh, one by Andy Abu, who's actually a student here uh, at Berkeley. Uh, actually, when I was a student here at Berkeley, um, he he didn't invent the circuit, but he made it more robust. So he added a couple of devices here, M7, M13, which give us actually better reliability in this. Uh, he, he looked at all sorts of breakdown mechanisms and modified the circuit so that under all conditions it's it's very robust. Um, if you look at this paper, he references uh, another paper by Thomas Cho, also a Berkeley student, uh, who <coughs> designed another version of this bootstrapper. And I think the reference goes back even further, you know, to a patent. So this is quite an old circuit, but very nice technique. Uh, here is kind of the ultimate proof that this circuit works. This is our, again, our NMOS resistance, right? This is the NMOS resistance. This is the PMOS resistance. This is that CMOS switch. And then this is this circuit. So you can see that over the full range of the input, I go from 150 ohms to 161 ohms. Okay, so the on resistance is nearly constant, and we already know why it varies, right? Body effect. So if I could, if I had a triple well process and I use an NMOS device, problem is gone, right? Or I could use a PMOS device in a well, and this would be nearly constant. Okay. Okay, so. The next important topic is charge injection. And there's actually two, two things that are commonly called charge injection. Uh, at the end of the day, we don't care where it comes from. As long as some extra charge gets dumped on our sampling capacitor, we're going to mess things up. And there's two big sources of that. One is the overlap capacitance right, that we talked about. And one is the actual channel charge, which is a lot more subtle and harder to get at. Um, if any of this is signal dependent, then we're going to get a signal dependent error, which is going to also produce distortion. If it's not signal dependent, then it's just going to produce an offset voltage. And we know how to deal with offset voltages, right? We can use fully differential circuits to get rid of offset voltages. So the distortion is actually a bigger problem than the offset voltage. And there's a couple of solutions we'll look at. One is a dummy switch, uh, and then finally the, the good solution, which is bo called bottom plate sampling. Okay. So actually, for the rest of the lecture, we're going to focus on the channel charge, but let me just say a few things about the overlap capacitance. Now, we, we already looked at this problem. We have our input voltage. We have an overlap capacitance here. So when this transistor is on, the capacitance here is charged to the input. As this voltage goes down, right, at some point, it's going to go to a voltage of V in plus V T, right? At that point, the, the switch turns off, right? So now my capacitor is disconnected from the input source, 
But this voltage still has a ways to go down, right? The clock goes all the way down to zero. So while this is going down, what happens here? Well, this voltage is also going to go down. And the amount that it goes down is exactly a capacitive divider. So this is CS, this is C overlap. And I know the amount that it goes down is given by this, let's call this delta V, the rest of the voltage that I need to go. And the fact that it, it is signal dependent is particularly alarming, right? So this is one problem. And the one solution to, to this problem, of course, is just make this capacitor larger, right? Make this capacitance large enough, then ultimately this is small enough and it goes away. But there's a better solution, and, and we'll talk about that. The other problem, which is a lot more subtle, is let's say I had a perfect transistor. And by perfect, I mean this is no overlap capacitances. So there's actually no capacitances on the input and output. Right? Somebody produces this in the lab, they get perfect alignment between the gate and source strain and overlap is negligible, right? Yahoo! You know, we got a perfect switch. But you still have a problem. Why is that? Okay. Let's get somebody on this side of the room. Asymmetry in the classroom. Shy people sit on the right. And somehow I tend to lean to the left, so you get away with it. Anybody on the right side of the room? My right side. Okay, Vincent? No overlap capacitances. Turn the switch off. What happens? Looks pretty good, right? And you know, notice I made this really big now because I don't have overlap to worry about. I can make this transistor big. The resistance is going to be low. I'm happy. Is uh, Ji Hoon here? Ji Hoon, do you want to try it? Any? Can you think of something? I'll give you guys a hint. How do you turn on a transistor? If this transistor is on, how much charge is it storing? Right? It's going to have some gate charge. What's the gate charge equal to? almost looks like a capacitor, right? So it's just CV, right? Except it has a threshold offset. So I have C aux, I have VG minus VT minus the input voltage, right? So I know that the gate terminal has this amount of charge. Well, where's the rest of the charge, right? Where's the minus QG? It's got to be somewhere. It's in the channel, right? So I've got channel charge. And <clears throat> when I turn the switch off, in effect, I'm discharging this capacitor, right? Where does that charge go? Does it go here? If it all goes there, I'm in, I'm in luck, right? Because now all this extra charge just goes to ground doesn't affect my sample. But what if it goes here? Then I'm in trouble, right? Because not only does it affect my sampled voltage, but it's also signal dependent. OK? So let's estimate what's the worst case value. So worst case, I'm going to be pessimistic and say, I don't know where that charge is going. I really don't. I'm going to just assume it all goes into my capacitor. Okay? So this is the channel charge, right? W times L times C aux 
Notice there's no factor of two-thirds or one-half or anything like that, right? Because this is a total channel charge, right? So this is the gate charge, which is also equal to the channel charge. And so this really should have a minus sign here, but who cares? Um, and so the worst case scenario is that all this charge ends up on my capacitor. So that produces a delta V of Q charge over C2. And so now I can plug in some numbers. My switch was 10 by 0.35. My sampling capacitor was a, pu was a puff, right? Uh, C ox is 5 picofarads or femtofarads. And worst case scenario is when this quantity is the largest when Vn is the smallest. So when Vn is 0, I get the full supply minus Vt. And that produces a 42 millivolt offset. Again, that's huge, right? If I were designing a, uh, a converter on a 3 volt supply and I want it to be 10 bits, right? 10 bits is 1,000. That's 3 millivolts. So this is much larger than my LSB. So I've got to do something about it. Okay, well, you could say you're being really pessimistic here, right? You're assuming all the charge goes into C2. So the question is, how much of it really does go into C2? And, you know, maybe the situation isn't as bad as you think. All right. Um, you might also say, you know what? Why did I use that big switch, right? I got all excited about my overlap capacitance. I used a big switch. But just use a small switch because the sm switch is small then the charge is small and so I can make this small. Okay. At the end of the day you can't make your switch small, right? Because the switch size was really determined by settling time requirements. And if, in fact if you look at it, the magnitude of this error is proportional to C aux over C2 times your supply voltage, roughly. And if you look at your time constant, the RC time constant, it's also proportional to C2 the charging, the cap you have to charge, and R0 is also proportional to supply voltage times C aux. So in fact, these equations look very similar. If I define a figure of merit as the voltage times tau, in other words, I want the offset voltage to be small, I want the settling time to be small, it's a product of these two things, and you can see a lot of things cancel out. Supply voltage cancels out, C2 cancels out, W cancels out, C aux cancels out, and by the end of the day, it's just a function of your channel length and mobility. Unfortunately, we can't do much about mobility as circuit designers. We have to go talk to our device friends and say, please give me more mobility, and they say it's the laws of physics. I can't do anything about it, and so all you can do is make things smaller, right? So at the end of the day, a small switch is not going to help you out, all right? Now, Maybe I'll do this a little bit in a different order. Let's say you want to know where this charge actually goes, because maybe you are going to get lucky and the charge is actually going to go towards your source and not towards your sampling capacitor. How would you find out? Well, to actually find out, you have to have a distributed model for your transistor. A lumped model With a lumped model for your transistor, there's no way to know what's going to happen to the charge. And that means that if you rely on SPICE, you say, well, SPICE will know. I don't know, but SPICE will know. No, SPICE doesn't know either. So SPICE, because it's a lumped model, can't tell you where that charge is going to go. It's actually a distributed effect. It depends on how quickly you turn off the switch relative to the omega t of the device. Um, it, it, in essence, it depends on the fact that you have this distributed channel and this distributed channel is going to discharge in such a way to satisfy effectively the wave equation, but without the inductive effects, because this is a very small circuit. And so one way to handle it is actually to have, imagine your switch as a bunch of transistors in series. And this is sometimes called the segmented model. So you say, okay, my transistor is actually five transistors in series, 
And now this is a quasi-distributed circuit. And if I make the number of sections large enough, I should be able to predict this distributed effect, even in SPICE. And people have done this and have tried to understand this problem. I guess we're going to have to talk about that next lecture.